Okay, skip the rest of that terribly entertaining video. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello. Uh, do feel free to visit the website of the chap who did the art for me. He's, he's awfully good. He does a lot of stuff like this. This is the sort of, um, this is the sort of graphics that computer games had when I was a kid. Aren't they awesome? Uh, loading time for a computer game was, what, about five minutes? And made a noise that could waken the dead. It was great. Also, don't ever put your computer game anywhere near a magnetic source, otherwise you just lost your game. Anyway, let's move on. This is me, a bit about me. Oh, I thought I'd put, yeah. Um, I've been in working in IT for quite a while now. I'm from the UK. Um, I've worked in a whole load of different industries. I've done government. Um, I've done retail. I've done manufacturing, various things. Briefly, I was one of those contractors that your mum used to warn you about. And these days, I work for Muller. Do they have Muller in Denmark? I, I don't know. They're pretty famous in the UK. They make these, these yogurts. Yogurts with lots of fruit in, yeah? No, I don't know. But uh, that's what I do. I make sure people get yogurt, which is always good. So, I'm going to talk today about being lazy, which I would argue is probably the thing that has moved forward nearly every technology on the planet, because at some point, somebody has sat down and said, this is boring, how can I do it better? Pretty much, oh, uh, there's my Twitter handle, by the way, feel free, I can bring that back later. Follow me on Twitter, even the unlikely event that anybody has a question or ever wants to talk to me ever again. Uh, heaven knows, uh, my, uh, my wife doesn't always want to, but there we go. All right, the, uh, the great uh, conflict of our time. We've got two men here, well, then they are both men. One of them's fooling no one. <laughs> and one of them follows the rules, does everything by the book, and the other is the slacker, the one who takes it easy and just does whatever. And of these two men, how many of them got to ride around in a flying time machine and almost sleep with his... No, don't do that one. <laughs> don't do that one. But the flying time machine, yeah. And honestly, I am far too lazy for an awful lot of the stuff that we have to put up with in coding. And that's kind of what I'm, what I'm looking at, is a whole load of techniques I've got for saving yourself some time, get rid of some boilerplate, get rid of some useless code that's doing no one any good. Now these, according to me, are the phases of a project. And which of these, as developers, because I'm assuming for a moment we're all developers, I don't know if that's true, but I'm going to assume it for the time being, which of these can we make any sort of a dent on in terms of saving us a load of effort and time? Well, gathering requirements is typically not us. Uh, designing a solution, again, typically not. Coding, yeah, and enhancements. And of these, by far, the thing that we spend most of our time on is enhancements. That is, not the initial development effort, but every single time you go back to the code base. Who has a code base older than 10 years? Yeah, that's most of you. 20 years? Still a lot of you. 30 years? Oh, okay, fair enough. I can have, I would, there were jobs when I could have put my hand up, but my point is, initial development, it might be a few months, it might be half a year, it might be whatever, but it's going to be in production for potentially 20 years or more. And every single time you go back in there, there's a whole load of messing around. And that is where the, any application spends the vast majority of its time. And that is where, when you look at the whole life of an application, we can try and save the most effort by writing code, which is incredibly easy to enhance. And what are the problems that can occur that make it hard to enhance code. Well, unclear requirements, that is between yourself and whatever BA you believe in. Project management issues, again, that's down to your PM. Legacy code base, on the other hand, that's a problem we can potentially deal with. And one of the problems with legacy code bases is the fact that the code is flipping unreadable most of the time. What does it do? This, code, this function is 2,000 lines long. It's called do stuff. It has four levels of nested if statements and calls to nested stored procedures in the database. I don't even know what it does. I don't know about anyone else, but I've had cases where there's been a box with three rules and the business have just said, there's three rules in that box, add a new rule. I said, great, well, the problem is the first rule split in four different places. The second one's half in the database, half somewhere else. I don't even know where the third one is. So yeah, sure, I'll just ram an extra rule in there, easy. So, I can't solve all of these problems, but I can at least try and uh, suggest some techniques that will, will help us to prevent this coming in the first place. So, again, according to me, these are the parts of a function. You've got the parameters, it's your stuff coming in. You've got your return value, stuff going out. But in the middle, we've got these two guys. 
And I would argue that an awful lot of the problems that we see with functions is where you get these guys muddled together, the code structure and the business logic. So what are these? Well, the code structure is the how am I doing it, the business logic is the what am I doing. If the business would ask you what does this do, the business logic is what you'd answer with. That is what it does. And what I would like to do is to try and pull these apart as far as possible. There's a concept in audio engineering called the signal-to-noise ratio. That is the ratio of the thing you were trying to listen to to the background noise. The thing you're trying to listen to is the album or whatever, the voice. The background noise is the hiss on a cassette or the rumble on a record or the album on a Justin Bieber album. <laughs> the thing you don't want to listen to. So, so how, can we, how can we achieve this? How can we separate out the signal and the noise? So part one, looking just at the, the micro level, just at the smallest point possible. What does this do? You've got five seconds. No. <laughs> There's a lot of noise in there. There's a lot of noise in there. Now, as it happens, this is going to a configuration file. It is trying to parse in the value into something rational. Uh, it is applying a default. That's an awful lot of stuff. That's an awful lot of lines of code. If I wanted to add in an extra setting, that is going to be one, two, three, four, five, about five extra lines every single time. This does not scale up well. And anyone who's never run into this for a while before, they're going to have to spend a bit of time staring at this to work out what it does. So I could throw in a um, extension method like this. Now, is everyone good with extension methods? Good, because it's going to be a tough talk for you otherwise. <laughs> so, this is a nice, simple little extension method. And what it is it doing is attaching to a string and saying, give me a default, then doing the check to see is it null or not, doing a try parse or not as appropriate, depending on what it is, and return either the default or this. You could also have a version with no default asked for and just return default yourself, depending on what you're trying to do. But the point is, it turns it into this. So what does that do? Same thing. Like you could look at that and understand that in five seconds, most likely. And how many lines of new code do you have to add in if you want to add a new rule? One. Sort of. Technically none, because it's all one line of code, but sort of. But the point is, even your manager could look at that and roughly understand what it does. Anyone, pretty much, could look at that and even understand that it's not doing what it's supposed to do if someone's put the wrong default in. It's really simple. And it reads somewhere close to natural language, which is great. It's easy to maintain. And all we did was put in a little extension method to hide away all of that tedious boilerplate. Now, extension methods get a bad rep, but I'm going to introduce my um, uh, commandments of extension method. Oh, when I say commandments, as always, it depends what you're trying to do. But this is roughly my guidelines for when it's good to use extension methods, and you should. No business logic. Business logic is the most important part of any application. That is what the app is trying to do. That should be right up at the front. That should be where everyone could see it. That should be screaming out the first thing you open the code base. Do not put business logic into extension methods. I have seen people do this. It is the road to disaster. The extension method is the equivalent of code that is like the snarf action figure from Thundercats. Do you remember Thundercats? Yeah. So you have it, you own it, you don't want to get rid of it. You also don't want to show anyone you've got it. So you just sort of pop it in a box at the back of the code base and it can exist, but no one needs to know. That's extension methods. That's what goes in them, that sort of code. Keep them compact. I generally try to keep them one line. Occasionally, I have to write more than one. Mostly, I write them to one. I keep them as small as possible. Discrete, tiny units of functionality. Works best that way. If you start putting too much in these things, well, then you've got a potentially dangerous bit of code that's doing far too much at the back of your code base that no one can see. Keep them generic. Apply them wherever possible to everything. Wherever I can, I apply them with T's, as in generics, so they literally apply to everything. I do that as much as I can. Keep them portable, by which I mean you should be able to take this box of extension methods and drop them into any project in your entire code base. We don't have a NuGet server at work at the moment, but we're working on it, and this is probably the sort of thing that's going to go in our NuGet server. Something that potentially then that could be consumed by all of our app, um, applications across the estate, so they can all benefit. 
and use them just wherever there's boring, repetitive code. Get rid of the code structure and hide it in these things, because who really cares? I don't. And make them useful. I was told, I did this talk once some years ago, and someone told me that they'd made an extension method called is true. That is not useful. It's interesting. It's great that you took the time out to do that, but it is not useful. So, that's my rules. A couple more extension methods that uh, I've used once in a while. This is for parsing. If you use this, you could potentially turn any string into an array of arrays and never need to bother splitting that all out again. And you just pass in the line, splitter, the field, splitter. There we go. Easy. There's probably some extra bits and pieces you could put in there, but it's the sort of thing you can do if you do it a lot. Or if you find yourself doing an awful lot of checking against both empty and null, just stick it in an extension method. It's kind of a little bit of a rule of thumb with me. Once I start finding myself doing the same thing two or three times, stick it in an extension method. Get rid of it. I don't really need to keep doing that. It's more lines of code than I need to write. I kind of like this one. I love dictionaries. Dictionaries is actually one of my favorite features in C Sharp. They're brilliant. They have some terrible flaws, but one of them is how tedious it is to make dictionaries. You have to supply two different lambdas. So why not just make an extension, ex uh, just make it one single function call, done. If it's a key value pair, there's a fair bet that I know which is my key and which is my value. So why am I needing to specify this? And there's some other, you can do it with tuples, you can do it with all this stuff. So that's, yeah. Uh, something else I've done once in a while, make a count dictionary. So do a group by, and then use the dictionary to sort by the key, and then tape a count. So therefore, you've got something that you can easily shove into almost any, um, any report you care to write when you're summarizing a whole data set. Anyway, that's some random examples of the sorts of stuff. Moving on from tiny little micro line bits of noise, let's move on to structural noise. This is slightly larger stuff. This is something I used to do an awful lot when I worked for an American company. So I am British, and as such, I talk a lot about the weather. Uh, that is a cliche, it is mostly true, we do, we do. Um, in the UK, you can easily get four different seasons in the same day. Such is our weather. We get about as much rain as everyone else, it just sort of happens at random through the year. So, American, uh, my American colleagues would say things like, it's 100 outside. Now, I'm not going to do the accent, because I, I can't, and it'd be embarrassing. But the point is that uh, I work in centigrade, and 100 centigrade, I would think, oh my gosh, that's the boiling point of water. How are you all alive? <laughs> but of course, this is it's Fahrenheit, which is what, I don't know, is that about 32 cent? I don't know, I don't really care. But um, the conversion, the conversion between Fahrenheit and centigrade is multiplied by 9, divided by 5, plus add 32. Of course it is, of course it is. And then convert it into a string when we're done. And that's a lot of, there's a lot of wasted code there. You've got these little temporary variables. Now, I could turn this into one great big long line, of course. That would be lovely, but then it would be unreadable. Um, this is readable, but I've had to waste all of these little local variables. Now, imagine that this function was a thousand lines long, there, and this was at the beginning. Well, var a is still in scope at the top. Sure, that's just, um, what is that? It's a decimal. That's fine. But imagine that it was a complex object, staying in scope all that time. We're just wasting space. So how can you get rid of this? Best little extension method you never realized you needed. This is map. I've heard this called all sorts of things, but uh, map is as good as anything for now. And this attaches to T input, which is a generic, so it's everything. And we take in a function which converts input to output and it gives out everything. So whatever it is, take your input, shove it in the function, pull it out again, pass it on. It looks like this. There we go. All those local variables gone. And there are some further benefits for this, which I haven't got the time to talk about now. If you get into functional programming, this is a structure called a monad. Um, and there's all sorts of funky things you can do inside this map to, uh, to save yourself errors and all sorts. But for now, this is nice and compact. We can kind of ignore the map because it's, it's just the same thing there. And uh, we've saved ourselves all those local variables. Plus, we can turn the whole function into an arrow function now, which means we are discouraging anyone from ever adding a whole ton of useless functionality into this thing. I like my functions to say small, to the point, and accurate to whatever the heck they're called. And don't like to encourage people to start adding new stuff in. Uh, it, by the way, this is how you might um, also do some logging in the middle of that stream. This is a T. Just do it like that. There you go. Stick an action in the middle. Now you can log if you want. So that is just going to log whatever the, that value is there, which, uh, why would I do that? But you can. You get the idea. How about this? 
is another situation where there's a whole load of tedious boilerplate to be written. Prepending, I don't know why I want to do this, but I want to do this. So I'm going to say hello to whomever, whomever I've just got the data from the database. And I'm going to call uh, two people. The first appears to be the devil. So that will give him value and presumably say hello, whatever his name is, Stephen. Uh, and then the other is 616, uh, the neighbor of the devil. Uh, what's his name? I don't know. Uh, George. So, but the point is 616 returns a null. And we're trying to prepend and pass in a null. Now, what happens when you do this? Explosion. Now, you could add in a whole load of boilerplate noise like this, where we're checking against default and then deciding whether we've done default. And all we've done is turn this lovely, elegant little function into something which has got flipping tons of extra lines that just exist to protect us from death. Or stick in another extension method like this. Now, the, the equality comparer there looks terrifying. It is just the generic version of checking against null because not everything actually in a generic necessarily defaults to null. Integers don't, booleans don't. You get the idea. And this is just doing that null check for us. So there we go. Potentially never need to do another null check again. All of that is now wrapped inside that functionality. If I call this do not if not null, then... Um, that's descriptive. It says what it does, and then whatever's inside will only be executed if it's safe to do so. Super duper. There's all sorts of other ways of doing that. I'm keeping it relatively simple in this talk. Dictionaries, like I said, one of my favorite things. I love them. I love how I work. I love the quick lookup. I love the lovely, elegant syntax. Uh, and as anyone who is into the same TV series I am might have noticed, I'm also into the TV series Doctor Who. Now, I don't know whether we have Doctor Who here. Uh, if anyone's unfamiliar, yeah, it's the best TV series in the whole world. It actually is. It's in the dictionary if you look it up. If anyone says otherwise, I'll find you. <laughs> so, I'm going to do a look up here to, see, uh, to get myself uh, a list of some doctors. So, if I got Doctor One out of this function, we'll get back William Hartnell, the boss. And if I put in 100, because it hasn't been yet, there will be, there will be. Uh, but if I looked in 100 and you put that into a dictionary, anyone know what happens if you put um, a, a lookup in a dictionary which is not a key that it currently holds? Anyone know? Exception. Sorry? Exception. Exception. Explodes. Why? That's ridiculous. But there you go. It's what it does. Fine. What can we do about this? Well, this is my solution. This, for me, is how you make dictionaries useful again because I don't like the explode if not found thing. That causes defensive boilerplate to be written, and I don't like that. It's boring. So what I'm doing here is using a func now, uh, as, as a filter. So I'm not actually returning a value out of this extension method. I'm returning a func, and the func is a filter. It's a filter that says, you ask me what you want. I'm going to go away into the dictionary and have a look. If it's not there, I'll tell you, and if it's there, I'll, tell, uh, I'll pull it back. And that's it. We don't need to worry anymore about having to do the null checks ourselves because this guy will do it for us. It's the filter that stops us from doing the thing that would cause the explosion. All it means is that you have to, uh, uh, now the, the actual lookup is now a func and we use curly break, we use, now use the curved brackets instead of the square ones. But other than that, it's still a dictionary. For as long as this func remains in scope, the dictionary remains in scope. So that's good. That's pretty good. So now we get a don't know back if we try to ask for Dr. 100. That's great. That's wonderful. But we could still do better. So I am going to imagine I want to get a whole set of doctors. Now, for some arbitrary reason, I want to get the first, third, and fifth. I don't know why I want to do that, but for the purposes of this explanation, that's what I want. Great. And I could create my array, and I could call uh, dd.getDoctor three times with a one, a three, and a five. Now, there's still an awful lot of boilerplate there. We can do better than this. So there we go. We could have an indexer. Let's cut down some of it. Indexers are good. They're a little static function. Well, not static, but they're little functions there. There we go. That syntax is much nicer, isn't it? It's not bad. But did you know, did you know that you could put params inside um, an indexer? Because you can. Now, have, oh, where's that? there we go. Have a look at that. That is functionally identical to the first one. If I put params inside the index, I just literally call the, uh, call the object and go one, three, five, there, inside, that's it. It does all three lookups for you. In fact, we're doing them in a select, so we're still getting the benefits of using link. That's awesome. And that's an awful lot less code than uh, the first version. 
Okay. This is one of my pet hates. I'm hoping none of you are doing it, but until I see people uh, stop doing this, I'm going to carry on doing this. So we're going to write ourselves a function, which is going to go away and um, grab some data, generate a report, transmit the data, and maybe make a transmission if, uh, if there's no data there. Great. Well, let's unit test this thing because we're good people. So positive test, we could put some data in. Yeah, those lines of code are covered. We'll do a negative test. There was no data. That line's covered. We'll do uh, some exception testing. That's good. Great. We've got 100% unit test coverage. This is marvellous. So we are pretty solid on our function. But then there is a rumbling on the ground. You look down at your coffee and notice like that scene in Jurassic Park, but it's quivering like this. And you look up and notice your unusually tall boss towering over you and asking you for prop two to be made into a function. Well, what's the easiest way to do this? Yeah, good, this video works this time. There we go. Copy. And... Ah, so easy. Yeah. Feels good, doesn't it? <laughs> Is that the best way to do this? Well, yeah, sure, it's easy, it's quick. But then what about prop three? What about prop four? What about prop 105, you know? I worked in an application many years ago for an awfully important company who I'm not allowed to talk about, but it's a lot less interesting than it sounds, trust me. Uh, but anyway, they had a rule base that had to be created every year. And every single year, they took the old rule base, it was quite a long rule base, and there'd be a couple of subtle changes, but they had to maintain each rule base simultaneously. So we just copy the old one, paste it into the new one, maintain this alongside it, make a couple of changes, and then maintain it. There was about 20, 30 of these things. And then I had to look at this and I said, hang on, there's a whole load of bugs in this one. Okay, that's the latest one. I just noticed all these bugs. Let's have a look at the one before. That's got all the same. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, I had to go and edit a whole load of years all at the same time because everyone had just trusted the folks before them to have done a good job and they just replicated the same bugs again and again and again and again. So that copy and paste job maybe didn't save you quite as much as you thought. That's uh, a lot of lines of code to maintain simultaneously. And what if someone comes up with a really super duper clever idea one day and you're going to apply it to all of them? I don't think so. So, I don't know what the proper term is for this. I call them donut functions. This is my solution. Turn that guy into a private, which is not a rank in the army. Pass in a func, which turns your sum data, whatever that is. That's your selector, that's telling you which field. Now, it could be an int. I'm assuming they're all ints. They don't have to be. And then just apply it there. So basically, I'm using the func as a whole in the middle of the function to apply the bit that's different. And I can do that every time. Now I can make that as complicated as you like. You could pass in many funks if you like. But the point is, I'm only ever writing one and I'm using the func to fill in the blank. Easy. I can now write as many, um, as many of these functions as you like and they're literally just lambda expressions every single time. If someone finds a bug in the root function, everyone benefits. And to be honest, if it were me, I probably wouldn't even bother to, um, to expose Prop 1 and Prop 2 as separate functions like this. I might even consider just literally generate average report and then just expose the lambda out. Why not? Saves a whole load more uh, time. But it depends, as always, what you're trying to do. But the point is, funk, see your friends. There we go. That's, that's just in case the video didn't work. Another place I use this is things like, uh, now I'm not the biggest fan of Entity Framework. It is a bit like getting a great big old sledgehammer to crack a nut, but um, it has a load of boilerplate that if you don't follow, you can end up with some terrible problems. And amongst them, make sure... Now, that's a terrible idea, don't do that. <laughs> I didn't realise I'd left that in there, don't do that. Uh, but anyway, the point is that you want to put a using around your data store, you want to call a two array at the end, don't call two list, you want to call a two array at the end. Uh, otherwise, you're exposing out stuff that really shouldn't be seen outside of the guts of your database layer. And you could do all of this with, um, sorry, that, by passing in iQueryables. Just write a func, iQueryable to iQueryable. You can expose that out, and then for the time that this func runs, it'll run here, 
And then for the ter within this func, you're basically exposing the query to be whatever. That's where people can write their great big long link queries to, uh, to query the database. And then two array is automatically called by the method at the end, so you can be sure that whatever comes out of it should be safe. <sighs> Anti-funny. So this is another sort of thing that we might do quite a lot, validation functions. So I am validating your username. There's a set of rules that I have arbitrarily decided on. Of course, it can't be empty. It can't be uh, shorter than two or longer than 20. It can't be just in Bieber because it can't. Now, my daughters are six and eight. Thankfully, they have not yet discovered much of an interest in him, and I am doing my best. <laughs> um, I, I told my youngest that uh, Kate Bush is cool because she has the same name as you. That's cool. Seems to have worked. Don't tell her. Okay. But anyway, same repeated functionality again and again. Early returns false, early return false, and then a final return true. How can we wrap all of this into a structure that we can reuse and chuck the boilerplate in the bin like this? That's an all. That's a link method. Link is absolutely one of the great greatest inventions ever in C sharp, um, along with dictionaries and record types, but that's a talk for another time. And the all goes through every item in the array and Every, it asks for an, uh, a func which has to evaluate to a boolean, and every single one of these booleans must evaluate to true. If any of them don't, then just cancel the whole thing out and return early with a false, which is exactly the structure of what we just did. So you could just write this. There we go. Isn't that an awful lot nicer to look at? A couple of benefits. It's really concise. It's easy to read. Again, you could show this to an awful lot of people who are not terribly technical and they probably understand. They might not know what this means, but it doesn't really matter because all they're really interested in is this. You could even hide it if you wanted to in a, a little local function or something just to give it a friendlier name. That would be fine. But you get the idea. And once again, it stops anyone from putting more into this function than really belongs to there. Because I do not like long functions. Is another example. This is another way of doing my conversion from um, uh, Fahrenheit Celsius. You could stick an aggregate. Now, I don't know if anyone knows aggregate, but aggregate, aggregate seems to be one of those great unknown features of C sharp. It's brilliant. Um, but it just basically does the same sort of principle as my map. You, you uh, start with something and just do a series of conversions. Here's the running total. Here's what we're doing with the current item. Just keep changing the current item to the new running total again and again and again. But basically, what you get out of it is this. Same basic idea. And now we can do away with the maps if we like. So this, again, is um, saving us an awful lot of effort. Did you know you can also put, um, yeah, so this is, a, what do you call that, a factory. We're looking at types and generating the child type. Well, did you know that you can also put types as the keys of a dictionary? Because you can. So you could do stuff like this. You could uh, switch in a dictionary based on type. Now, come to think of it, this is probably a little out of date. If you're using C Sharp 8, you've probably got better things you can do now. But this slide was written before those sorts of stuff. Uh, those new features with the new pattern matching were brought in. So, but still, this option is available to you. And look, I can look at with the default again. Look at that. Right. Being lazy with enumerables. I like enumerables too. Enumerables are like me because they're lazy. An enumerable is not data. That's the most important thing to know about an enumerable. It is not data. It is a pointer to data. All enumerable is is a little box that says, it's that way. And that's all an enumerable is. And it's got two buttons. One that says, spit out the current one, and the other one that says, move to the next one. Enumerable doesn't even know how many there are. All it knows is this one, next one. And that's cool. If you wait as long as possible, with actually evaluating your enumerable into something solid, like an array, then it remains unenumerated. So this is, so this is, this is what our enumerable looks like. Now, I am aware I'm not very good at drawing. I do my best, but still, I've improved. But um, all it is pointing at is like, now, imagine that we wanted to amend this array, but without actually enumerating it. Now, this is trivial. This is just like, I could make that as cars if I wanted. It does not matter. But imagine that each one of these was a giant complex object. Maybe it's an entity framework lookup. It could be something massive. And it could be an, exp rather than just being simply moved to the next item in an array, 
it could be an inexpensive operation that has to be performed. Or if that's the case, amending that requires you to uh, force it to become a concrete object, do whatever those operations are, just in order to change the third item. And then what if you don't need it later? Well, you've just defeated all the benefits you got from your lazy loading. So this is a way of amending an array without actually amending it. You could, uh, still, there we go. Yeah. So we're pointing out, we could, still, what am I doing here? Right. There we go. Like this. I call it adjust. And again, it's kind of like a filter. It's a filter that sits between the innumerable and, um, so you've got your innumerable that you're looking at and the one on, and the actual solid data on the other side. And I've stuck this structure in the middle. And this structure is a select. Now a select returns an innumerable. So a select does not actually evaluate to anything until we've actually enumerated it. So by adding this select in the middle like this, we're again using a funk like a filter and saying, here are some conditions under which we should think about replacing the current item. And should we do the replacement or not? Now it sounds like you're doing a whole load of stuff all at the same time, but you're not, you're not. A select only evaluates when you need it. So if you do, for example, select, then select, then select, then select, those don't actually execute in the order you think. They don't go do all of the stuff in this one and then do all the stuff in that one. They actually go one, two, three, four, like that. So you can call it like this with the enumerables in the middle, but it's not actually doing anything. So when I call array A, there we go, that's an array. Now array B there, right now, if the compiler was on this line right here, array A hasn't changed, nothing's been done. Literally nothing has been done. All you've done is define an operation that you might want to do sometime in the future. Same here, when we go here, still nothing done. But what I've done is put in a description of the sort of changes I want to do in the future. Now, when you actually try and enumerate C, what you'll find is it will actually say, okay, this says go to B, I'll go here. This says go to A, I'll go here, grab that, go here, go here. Okay, no adjustments to be made. I'll just return you an A then. And that's how that works. I wouldn't do it with these guys. That's just a car. But again, if it's important that you try and reduce the amount of um, array uh, enumeration of the enumerable that you're doing, this is an, uh, a technique you can use. There you go. Has it in a rather badly drawn diagram. So imagine it is a series of filters. Each call to adjust is like sticking a filter between the enumerator and the, uh, the final array at the end. Another thing you can do, this is, goodness me, they're onto me, run. <laughs> uh, right, what if I wanted to check for contains consecutive numbers? That is one num a number that's one higher than the other. Spoiler, there's one. So yeah. You can't actually compare in enumerable the same um, items that are consecutive. It can't be done. You can do that uh, if you converted it to an array, but once again, then you've busted your, uh, you've enumerated, and as such, you've lost your lady lo lazy loading benefits. So the way that you can do that is you can crack open the enumerable, because this is the engine that runs underneath the enumerable. Oh, good to me, I needed that. Okay, underneath an enumerable is something called enumerator, and the enumerator is that thing with the two buttons on it. This is the thing that actually drives the enumerable. If you crack this open, you can make an enumerable which behaves in any manner that you want. You want it to every single iteration return the same item twice? Sure, do it. That's how you do it. You can make an enumerable behave any way that you want. Now, what I'm doing is, is creating an extension method I'll call any, but this time I've got a func which I'm passing in, which is t, t, bool. Um, that is the current item, the previous item, are they the same or not? And this is how you can use an enumerator. Move next is the thing that says go to the next one. Now an enumerator starts at position minus one. So by default, if you try and call current, which is to get the current item out of an enumerator when you haven't started, you'll just get an error, it'll be null. So you have to move next. Move next returns true if there is another item or false if there's no further items. So what this is saying is take my enumerable, move next, that is go from position minus one to position naught, and then um, call my any, which is to say, pass in this, which is the enumerable, just pass it around, or the enumerator, sorry. 
pass in the functioner again, and this dot current. So I am moving to position naught, taking current, and then passing into the next step. Bear with me. And this is my actual thing. This is the actual function that's doing that check against consecutive. Once again, we're saying move next. So we've already to, um, pulled out the first item. We've got it in this hand. We've popped it there. That's current. We're going to move next again. So we're now at position one. And then we're going to say run the function. I've got position naught in this hand. I've got position one here. Pop them into the function. Are they true? Well, great. Then we'll return true. Done. Otherwise, we'll call ourselves again. This is a recursive function. But this time, I am taking the current item and passing it in as if it were the previous. So what we're doing is sort of juggling like this, going past the current back to be the next previous. And eventually, if there's no more out of uh, move next, then we just return false. Whew. That was terribly complicated, but it looks like this. All it's doing is compare the previous item with the next. And we can run through every single item in there and check whether any of them are, where the, was it y equals x plus 1? There you go. There probably needs to be a master abs in there, to be honest, if I were being really accurate with this, but it's fine. It'll do. Attributing, how are we doing? No, we're doing fine. I'm doing fine today. Good stuff. Excellent. So, to return back to Doctor Who, because I generally do, as a warning, if you ever see me again, I will talk about it at length. Uh, just try asking my opinion of season 13. It ain't weren't good. But anyway, some episode data for Doctor Who. This is a CSV, and we want to parse this into uh, a data structure because, I don't know, we're running a report or something, whatever. And this is based on, I think, season 12 as it happens. Those are the episodes, the titles, blah, blah. Fine, no worries. Can write ourselves a quick little parser, no trouble at all. Can't me. I can pass this around, maybe generate a CSV, maybe generate a report, doesn't matter, but the point is, Fine. But then we look at the data for season 11, and we'll see that is subtly different. You see there? That's the number of the episode within the season. That's the number of the, that same number, but the, this is the number of the story number of Doctor Who overall, counting all the way back to the first episode in 1963. Because, I don't know, they must have been using a different data structure that year. This is a silly made-up example, but I'm sure we can all think of similar things where the data structure has changed over time and we have to deal with this. So sure, we could. There's all sorts of ways of dealing with this. Here's the super simple one. Yeah, you could copy and paste the function, but don't do that. Um, but this is one way. You could use a dictionary, and you could use a dictionary which is going to get you a funk out of it. That's a method. Nothing wrong with that. I would be proud enough of that. So store all the different converter functions inside the dictionary, use an enum to say which season is it, and then get yourself the correct converter and then feed that into something. That's fine, nothing wrong with that. We could do better, could do better. Uh, yeah, that's, that's my parser, that's how I'd use it, so yeah, split on. Now it's always environment new line, we're using commas to split on the field, so but what if that, and then just pass in the converters. So there you go, pass the season into the converters, easy. But we could go better. We could look at attributes. Attributes is one of those awesome features that no one seems to use very much. But attributes are pretty cool. Attributes are tags that you can apply to code. If you've ever used MVC, you've probably seen attributes. It uses them quite a lot. And you can make your own. And it is literally as easy as that. There you go. I've made myself an attribute. And all you have to do is tell it what data do you want to pass into that. So there we go. Look at that. What I can do is create an abstract of episode data to say that uh, there's the title, the season, number of episodes, and so on. And then I could use attributes to say which position within the CSV are they. Here's the season 11 data, which is actual instance of episode data. And I'm saying the season number is apl applied there in the tag at the top. So that's an integer that I can use to pass into things. And then I can say the CSV here is in position one. And down here, the title is now in position two in the season 12 data. There we go. We just have to write ourselves one super duper complicated function to do this. But you only have to do it once. It kind of look a bit like this. I'm not going to dwell too much on it because, frankly, it's ugly. But you only have to do it once. That's the simple one. That's just the getting the season number, the attribute off the, uh, the classes. Getting attribute off classes is quite easy. You just pretty much do it like that. And you can get, so here we go. Getting the attributes of a property, a lot harder. 
Looks like that. That's pretty flipping ugly, not going to lie, but there you go. That's how you do it, in case you're curious. I had to go all the way down to breaking uh, funks into expressions. Fine, I did it. I flipping did it. <laughs> it's using some reflection, too. So if um, one of your overriding concerns of your business is performance, this probably isn't the very best, but honestly, 99.9% .9 of us are never going to notice. And whenever people come to me and say, well, that's not, you know, that's, not, that's not the optimum performance, that's, yeah, 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 yeah. But the thing is, what costs more? About two weeks of your time or one round trip? I'm going to bet the round trip's a lot cheaper, so just, sure. And especially these days when we're all going azure and cloudy and aws -E and so on, someone just has to go to a computer, press a button, there we go, it's running faster now. So, is it really... And that's, that's how I'd use it. So, yeah, again, it's not the, uh, not the prettiest of code, but what it means is I've written a single generic episode parser which can have a, um, a dynamic property used with, uh, in an attribute to determine what is the season number, where in the CSV can I find the title, and uh, now the number of episodes is hard-coded there, which yeah, that's not strictly true, but we'll go to that another day. And then where's the writer, which is just X3. But oh my goodness, we've got more complicated stuff when we start going into old data. What if um, the writer was in different places? There we go, we can just add in season 10. Though we've got a couple of different CSV positions, but it's just the same basic idea. Even if older data does go and rearrange the fields, we just use the CSV position attribute again, easy. Every single time we get the data in a slightly different format, we can handle it. And this is just passing integers around. You can pass anything into an attribute. You can pass a funk into an attribute if you really want to. There's all sorts of things you can do. I wouldn't do that, though. But, um, yeah, whatever you need in there, you can pop it in. It's not a problem. You can put the line delimiter in there. What if the really old data doesn't even use uh, commas and new lines? There you go. You can just put it in the attribute. Right. So your entire of your um, your entire of your season ten parser class consists of two properties and a load of attributes. You can tell the boss I spent all day on this. I'm just you know so like flipping overworked, and uh, go and watch um, for Stranger Things four for a bit. I didn't say that. <laughs> right, that's it. That that worked out pretty well. Any questions at this point? This is uh, anybody. Going once, going twice. <laughs> Okie dokie, I'm hoping that you're so... Oh, sir. Uh, readability. Readability, sir. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so you can also use the attribute and then you can use As in, uh, so forgive me. So are you meaning like, um, so, so like my, my little parsing attribute thing, getting a new user, like say one of our office juniors to, to come in and look at that. It's a good question. Yeah. So the question is looking at that like attribute parsing thing, that, that was an ugly bit of code, not going to lie. What about your, your junior members who are still learning C sharp and how are they going to cope with, I would argue that they don't need to look at it. I would argue that your, your young, your junior members of staff, Mostly, we're not going to give them that sort of level of task, at least at first. That's something they're going to build up to. We'd probably ask them to do that. And they don't need to understand how it works. This is the beauty of these sorts of bits of code. We can hide away all the complexity, and they don't really need to know how it's working under the surface. It's like, who cares, really? If all the, the, the task was simply go and write the, the, um, the season two parser, and there's a couple of differences, they've got enough skill to do this. Uh, as long as there's no new attributes in there, but uh, if we've written this thing well enough, it should be able to handle anything. So I would argue that, uh, oh, sorry. Where am I going to work? Huh? You said I'm getting a new job, where, where shall I work? <laughs> Can I work with you? <laughs> no, I was just saying that if you're going out the door and uh, the other teams are trying to take over, mm. and there's a bug in that code, sure. then they have to fill in the bugs. 
sure. I mean, that's, that's where you'd need a more senior member of staff to potentially, although if you've been a good boy and you've unit tested it, you've got that at least, hopefully. So you've got you, you, I would never say do not write unit testing for extension method. You should, or at least by usage, if nothing else. So you've got your unit test. I mean, I probably could have written it a bit more sort of split out and a bit more logical than I did, but I was just doing it for demonstration purposes. I'm not really necessarily going to throw that into production. I'd probably put... Now, I'm big into functional programming, so I'd probably lot a lot of other data structures in there that would do some other stuff. But again, that's a talk for another day. But um, yeah, I would probably try and write it a little more split out and a little bit more logical. But um, still, mostly, I would stand by my argument that... Um, Someone new is probably just going to use the surface level, and as they grow within the company, they'll start then moving into the deeper levels of, uh, and probably any reasonably competent engineer could probably pull apart what I did. It was, I didn't do anything really crazy in that, uh, that attribute parsing thing. That was mostly based on examples on the Microsoft website and how to mess with, with attributes. It is a bit ugly, though. It's just the way it is. As soon as you start messing with reflection, things can get pretty nasty pretty quick which is why I use it sparingly, but it depends, as always, what you're trying to do. So I hope that answers your... Uh, no. uh, any more for any more? Sir? Yeah, you mentioned that you should not put the business logic, business rules into the extension method. Yes. Could you expand on that? Uh, okay. So the question is, why should you not put business logic into extension methods? One second, sorry. Oh, my throat feels like there is a cactus in it. <laughs> right, that's better. Um, so, reason being, extension methods exist to hide things. That is their purpose. They exist to make things go away. And by pu I put things in extension methods that I don't want to see. Things that are unsightly or tedious. Business logic is the most important part of your code base. There is nothing in your code base more important than the, basically the code that tells people what this code does. That should be right at the front. That should be where everyone can see it. I have worked in a company where some crucial business logic was high, hidden in an extension method. I didn't even notice it was there for ages. I just saw like, you know, line one, it does this, line two, it does this, line three, it just went crazy. What? And it took me a while of staring to realize there was an extension method that they'd added in. Because the beauty of extension methods is they're, they're invisible, really. They don't you wouldn't necessarily even realize they're extension methods. They're a way of hiding stuff. I think they're brilliant. I think they have their uses. And the best thing you can do with them is basically just like sweeping dust under the rug. You know, it's like, it's a way of getting rid of stuff you don't want to see. But you shouldn't hide business logic. That's important. Um, if the business come to you and say, we want to adjust the business logic, you want to know, like that, where is it? I know where the business logic is. There, I will change it and adjust it. I don't want to be hunting around my code base trying to work out where on earth it is. I have, I've worked some pretty awful places where it was hard to find where the logic was. And it turned development efforts that should have taken an hour or two into weeks of work because it was unclear where the important code was. Um, so uh, I hope that is, yeah. Uh, any more for any more? Sir? Sure. Okay. Um, the gentleman's uh, point was that uh, you might put something in an extension method that would be something you'd expect Microsoft to do in the future. Sure. I'd love for them to. I would love for them to flip and change the way dictionaries work. Um, I don't know if there's anyone from Microsoft here, but if there is, I'll, I'll, I'll say that to write to them because I love dictionaries. But that explode if not found thing is ridiculous. But uh, I agree with you. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I've put in there, I would love to see that go into micro into .NET at some point. Um, so, but yeah. Good point. Um, but I would probably try and keep to that sort of level. I, I wouldn't put anything specific to my business in an extension method in any, even if it's a bit of sort of, even if it's not literally business logic, even if it's just a little bit of logical branching that's unique to my business, I still wouldn't put it in an extension method. That's too distinctive to us. I'd only ever write an extension method I could literally throw anywhere in the world. So sure, I, I, I agree with your point. Um, any more? We've still got another 10 minutes. Once, going twice. Okay, well, thank you very much. And also, um, if anyone's interested, there's my Twitter again. Uh, no, this isn't my Twitter, sorry. I am writing a book. 
for O'Reilly, if anyone is interested. This is on functional programming. If you scan this thing here, O'Reilly will give you a month free on their platform. It's awfully nice of them. So feel free, please. It doesn't cost me anything. So go for it, why not? Uh, if also, if anybody is willing to spare a little time, we are looking for proofreaders for my book. Uh, I'm running about four or five chapters at the moment, so if anyone has any free time and is willing to give a few review comments, I'd be awfully grateful. Come and have a chat with me, send me a message or whatever. Um, but other than that, thank you very much.